Well, folks, we made it. Another year is in the books. 2022 is done with. And you know what? We say this every year, but I feel like 2022 was one of the craziest years in wrestling on record. You know, it was wild when the story of Steve Austin coming back to the ring after a 19 year hiatus was like the ninth or 10th biggest thing of the whole year. I wanted to make sure that things were absolutely done before I posted this. My picks for the top eight worst things about wrestling in 2022. Some of these you might agree with, some you you might not, but hey, it's all just my humble opinion. And for those of you who are wondering, tribal wrestling fans, you're not on the list this year. Your jersey's retired, but don't worry. We all know you're still here. Let's begin. Number eight, Tessa Blanchard leaves another company? Wow! Way back in my worst of 2021 video, I made this observation. So is WOW being revived for the good of women's wrestling or for just one wrestling woman? Hard to say for sure at this point, but by building their company around someone as controversial and toxic as Tessa, this rebuilt version of WOW may already be on loose foundation. Look, I know I don't get too many predictions right around here, so please let me have this layup. Last year, WOW Women of Wrestling was brought back from the dead yet again as a rehabilitation spot for Tessa Blanchard, who in her relatively brief career has developed a cancerous reputation in the locker room. Impact Wrestling's first and only female world champion was seemingly meant to be the cornerstone of WOW's revival, both as the main star and its head talent scout, but reports of a falling out soon emerged in the spring. You know things are going great there when the talent has to sign NDAs and the company bends over backwards to ignore her prior controversies. WOW Superheroes is still chugging along on CBS affiliates on the weekends, featuring a cast of relative unknowns apart from AJ Mendez and a canned studio aesthetic not unlike that of Lucha Underground or, you know, Wrestlelicious. It's not hard to imagine that Tessa would have easily stood out among a roster full of figurative babes in the woods, and despite her whole impossible to work with vibe, her involvement might have added more value to the WOW brand. But for right now, Blanchard remains a controversial free agent. But hey, at least she got a shirt out of it. Number seven, rest in peace NXT UK and 205 Live. The problem with treating every new wrestler or property or concept as if it's the next greatest thing in the world is that when you take your foot off the gas, even just a little, it's super obvious. Case in point. Both 205 Live and NXT UK got their starts with tournaments to crown the inaugural champs of those divisions. 2016's Cruiserweight Classic and the United Kingdom Championship Tournament one year later were both expertly done events, some of the freshest stuff WWE had done in ages, so both shows began with tons of momentum. Unfortunately, the Cruiserweight division was relegated to a near-dead entity soon after its much-hyped debut, one of several times over the years Vincent Mann seemingly lost interest in pushing that style of wrestling. By the end of 205 Live's run, they did didn't even bother to enforce the weight requirement that was featured in the name of the show. Meanwhile, the creation of NXT UK led to a gutting of the British independent wrestling scene, which WWE was riding the coattails of from the beginning, leaving a bad taste in the mouths of many fans. The pandemic and the speaking out movement did few favors for Brit rest in general, and NXT UK was not immune from these obstacles. Despite delivering a great in-ring product and frequent attempts to prop the champions up on NXT Florida, 205 Live and NXT UK K were dying on the vine for months. Triple H's health scare in 2021 proved to be the final nail for both brands, as both would go under in 2022. Number six, Sasha Banks and Naomi walk out. In wrestling and in life, it's important to know your worth, or more specifically, your perceived worth. Perceived worth is what got Hulk Hogan an extra $2 million for re-signing with WCW in 1998 and an additional 20 grand just for wearing NWO shirts in public. If only I got paid extra for wearing my merch to the grocery store. After years of being arguably the best entering performer of the four horsewomen, helping bring the house down in a WrestleMania main event, and even expanding her resume with shows like The Mandalorian, some might have accused Sasha Banks of being on a high horse of her own. Still, it was a shock when she and her tag team championship partner Naomi walked out of the May 16th episode of Raw. It seems that after being promised that the maligned women's tag division would be given a boost with them as champions, Banks and Naomi were disappointed to find out that no shit that wasn't going to happen. When their pleas to change creative were ignored by Vincent Mann, the two walked out and got raked over the coals on air by the commentary team. The incident was eerily similar to what happened 20 years prior when Steve Austin walked out in similar fashion, frustrated that the company was not taking advantage of his perceived worth. I'm thankful I'm done with the pizza. I don't eat that anymore. I eat steak. 
like Vince McMahon. Fast forward eight months. The way the women's tag belts have been handled since their departure is kind of proven the point of their walkout, and now this has happened. Whether or not Mercedes Monet can help move the needle for New Japan and stardom remains to be seen, but if she can, consider it a dropped ball by WWE. And speaking of their women's division, number five, Ronda Rousey, SmackDown Women's Champion. Were there worse wrestlers around in 2022? Sure there were. There was Satnam Singh, Marina Shafir, both Veer and Shanky. Oh, Vince and Shane McMahon each got ring time last year and they were both pretty crap at it. But as far as somebody with as much hype and prestige surrounding her, Ronda Rousey fell hard last year. When Rousey first arrived in the scene as an active competitor for WWE in 2018, it was a huge deal. And though things were sort of shaky, it was still much better than people could have predicted. It was her star power that helped justify a women's main event at WrestleMania at MetLife Stadium. But just a few years later and... <sighs> yeah. Her Rumble win in January was incredibly deflating. Her performances against Charlotte Flair and her quest to win the blue belt were subpar. Her bouts with ladies like Liv Morgan and Shotzi left a lot to be desired. And oh yeah, have I mentioned her promos are still terrible? At one time, Ronda Rousey being involved in the world of wrestling was a really neat thing because of the name recognition she had in MMA and the work she'd done in Hollywood. But after four years, coming back from hiatus to be a mom, poor creative, and a total lack of character evolution, now Ronda is just there. And what's just there ain't all that great. Number four, Big E's injury. It's always rough seeing a world champion lose their belt then plummet down the card soon afterward, but for my money, nobody's post-title malaise was as swift and near tragic as that of Big E's. 2021 was his freaking year, man. A run as the Intercontinental Champion, Money in the Bank winner, calling his shot and cashing in to beat Bobby Lashley for the WWE Championship. Truly a deserving win if ever there was one. But the reign itself wasn't as prominent as many had hoped, thanks in large part to him losing a lot for a babyface champion. Here at Regret HQ, we call that Rey Mysterio Syndrome. One of those losses came from Roman Reigns at Survivor Series, a program that wasted precious time and momentum for Big E since Roman's spot as tribal chief who was never going to be in question. It didn't take too long for 2022 to go sideways, as the Day 1 pay-per-view on New Year's Day saw this New Day member take a pinfall from Brock Lesnar in a fatal five-way to lose the title, a fitting end for a championship reign that barely seemed to have any care and consideration for it in the build-up, much less during. But the loss of his championship can't compare to what happened just two months later on an episode of SmackDown. With just weeks to go before WrestleMania, Big E fractured his C1 and C6 vertebrae after getting suplexed on the floor by Ridge Holland. Though the injury didn't require surgery, E has openly stated that his wrestling future remains in doubt. If Big E never wrestles again, it'll be a heartbreaking end to a career that defied the odds in numerous ways over the years. Here's hoping that Big E can one day mount a comeback in the ring and get another shot at being a top guy. Number three, AEW's rollout of honor. The end of 2021 saw the end of Ring of Honor as we knew it, when their owners at Sinclair Broadcasting pulled the plug. I gotta be honest with you, as somebody who was part of that company for its last two years, it was a bitter pill to swallow. I loved my time in Ring of Honor and was sad to see it end, but I thought it was still cool to be part of history and be on the last ROH show, you know? Then Tony Khan bought the company from Sinclair and there was all this anticipation from everyone as to what he was gonna do with it. And whether I was part of this new chapter or not, I was still thrilled to see what Tony would do with the brand going forward. Now, Impact already beat him to the punch with an invasion storyline, but maybe there was still a chance for ROH to become a pipeline promotion, at least on an official basis, that is. It would be fitting considering that ROH in an alternate timeline could have become what AEW is now if a couple things went differently. The only problem with TK acquiring the brand was he didn't really have anywhere to show it except for his existing TV properties. That meant that over the course of several months, not only did AEW have to find room for their infinitely expanding roster, they also had to shoehorn an ample amount of ROH talent into the fold to make the brand seem viable. And with those ROH wrestlers came titles, six in total on top of all of AEW's championships. The situation reeked of the acquisition of Mid-South Wrestling by Jim Crockett Promotions in 1987, which glutted up their programming with extra titles and wrestlers, much like ROH and AEW in 2022. Now, it's not fair to call the continuation of ROH under Tony Khan a failure because that isn't true. Since the buyout, the three pay-per-views they ran did great numbers for buy rates and attendance. And me personally, I'm always happy to see my friends and colleagues 
leagues get to stay in the spotlight. But without a TV deal in sight, whatever build they could get for those pay-per-views had to take up AEW airtime. I'm pretty sure the world and pure titles are part of the reason that feud with the Blackpool Combat Club and the Jericho Appreciation Society went so damn long. Having to focus so much on ROH meant taking that focus off a lot of other people and storylines, which hurt the overall product in the eyes of a lot of fans. You can make an entire new company with the wrestlers they have on hand that still barely got airtime last year. Then after months of waiting, it was announced that ROH's TV deal would exist behind a paywall as part of a subscription to their Honor Club service. Getting regular TV would have been nice, but then again, NXT got its start on the WWE Network and that show was certainly a major selling point, so who knows? After all this though, I don't blame Tony Khan for the choices he made. No doubt he was a huge fan of Ring of Honor Wrestling and it's hard to watch something you love for so long die. Technically, ROH seems to be doing better now than they were before the buyout. But unfortunately, there are reasons fans chose AEW over Ring of Honor, and they probably didn't want to be reminded of that every week on Dynamite. Number 2. Wrestlers in Trouble with the Law from legends sullying their reputations to more failed expectations, wrestlers and crime partnered up way too often this past year. There was a time in May when former NXT standout Jake Atlas was arrested for assaulting his partner in a lover's quarrel involving another person. This all happened soon after he suffered a huge knee injury in his one and only AEW bout. Safe to say, 2022 was not his year. Deathmatch wrestler G. Raver was arrested and hit with felony charges in November after he and a friend were found passed out in a car with a whole lot of drugs. And speaking of illicit contraband, how about Michael Elgin, who was removed from pro wrestling Noah's roster after being questioned by authorities in Japan for allegedly stealing protein powder back in July. The former ROH world champion denied the claims and would soon come back to North America, where he'd go on to commit yet another crime, being a wrestler who transitions into stand-up comedy. Even though Ted DiBiase, his sons, and their ministry were caught in a huge welfare fraud scandal in Mississippi back in 2020, they're still taking the shellacking for it today, as they're one of several defendants in a $20 million lawsuit from the state's Department of Human Services that was opened in 2022. Every man does have a price, and with Papa Ted, that number is very likely to go up. Jeff Hardy was once again arrested for driving under the influence back in June of last year, the second time in three years. The timing couldn't have been worse for Brother Nero, who was just in the midst of another Hardy Boys reunion in AEW. After being released from WWE for his bizarre actions at a house show in Texas, he inevitably found his way to AEW, where he crammed as many insane spots as he could in a three-month period before stumbling yet again, leading to an indefinite suspension, fumbling the bag in a major way for he and his brother Matt. And finally, Tammy Sitch, better known as Hall of Famer Sonny, awaits trial later this month for her involvement in a car crash in March that led to the death of a 75-year-old man whose car she hit while under the influence. What makes Sonny's latest offense so infuriating is that she was even allowed to drive at all, having racked up so many DUIs over the years, you'd think she was trying to win something. It's a tragedy that could have easily been prevented. And my pick for the worst thing about wrestling in 2022 is AEW's locker room drama. By the end of All Out 2021, AEW appeared to be untouchable. It was a knockout show full of high octane matches, big surprises, huge debuts. It was a lot of fun to watch and had many fans looking forward with great anticipation for the future. Huh, what a difference a year can make. Even though the departures of Cody and Brandy Rhodes earlier in the year was a shock given their status as founding members, AEW still had plenty of momentum. But as the months went on, more cracks seemed to appear in its veneer. Stories of scraps and outright brawls backstage, wrestlers throwing shade at co-workers in interviews. But this was only the tip of the iceberg. First, there were the reports of tension between MJF and Tony Khan over future pay. Things escalated to the point where MJF blew off an appearance at Double or Nothing Weekend, setting off a frenzied search for answers and an eager anticipation to see if he would appear at the pay-per-view at all and do the honors for Wardlow. MJF did indeed do the job in abbreviated fashion, then seemed to burn it all to the ground with an irate rant toward TK on an episode of Dynamite. Though they managed to turn all this real-life rancor into a storyline by the fall, it was not a good look. I just gotta know, what's the deal with all this anger and discontent? God forbid what'll happen if a real HR problem emerges. I'm hurt and I'm old and I, I'm fucking tired I totally and I work with fucking children. On the August 17th edition of Dynamite, CM Punk took time out of his promo to call out Hangman Page, someone he was not having a program with anytime soon, so Page looked bad either way. The shot by Punk apparently came from his belief that the EVPs of the company were conspiring against him politically by spreading a rumor about why Colt Cabana was taken off the road as a 
wrestler and producer. Hangman made an incredibly vague reference to it on air that would have flown over everyone's heads had it not been for this counter shot by Punk. Fast forward to the end of All Out during the media scrum, and injured Punk's concerns had gone unaddressed, so he took to the people with his frustrations, angrily calling out his co-workers and Tony Khan's co-executives, while Khan sat next to him, frozen in disbelief. Look at these happy so-and-sos from the same time last year. What happened to them? Then came the infamous backstage fight between Punk and the Elite. Lots of different perspectives and stories and corrections were made in the retelling of events, which resulted in the suspensions of everyone involved, the stripping of championships, tons of creative plans up in smoke and a black eye on the company's reputation. Even to this day, we still don't have a comprehensive breakdown of what actually happened, partly because Khan has been so mum about the whole thing. The timing couldn't have been worse, just as WWE was regaining major ground after Triple H's takeover. Either this winds up the most elaborate and brilliant long-term story in wrestling history and we were all made fools of, or it's an indictment of their failure to install a proper talent manager and keep things professional backstage. Wrestlers are a unique hybrid of jobs and theater kids, and managing their egos is a complicated undertaking. AEW is not the first or last wrestling company to suffer blow-ups like this, but the frequency in which they came in 2022 is a disturbing trend. It's a huge distraction from what goes on with the in-ring product, and frankly, I am so sick to death of going online and seeing a report of a backstage tiff, and a million people debate if it's a work that benefits no one, or a shoot that benefits no one. Perhaps in 2023, AEW can turn their act around and get things a bit more harmonious in the locker room. But for now, the endless stream of backstage bickering and infighting is my pick for the worst thing about wrestling in 2022. So what else belongs on the list? I'm sure you have a lot of things to say about it, so please speak freely in the comments section below. And come back in two weeks when I bring you my picks for the best of wrestling in 2022. Be sure to give the video a thumbs up if you like it, subscribe, and click the bell for all the updates from Wrestling With Regret in 2023. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.